Amen. Tonight we are talking about the good stuff. Huh? Yes, please. Oh, t- just to let you know, Crossroads now has a props budget. <laughs> Obviously, you haven't been giving a whole lot to it, but uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the good stuff. You know, in life, there's the stuff, and then there is the good stuff. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Bring up that, uh, that next slide there. For those of you who are not vegetarian, that is the good stuff. <laughs> right? In Chicago, there is a restaurant called Texas de Brazil. Amen. It is the good stuff. I'm pretty sure that they pray over their food because as I ate it, I instantly felt closer to God. (laughs) So if you are feeling like your relationship with God is a bit dull, you need to book a ticket and go eat at Texas de Brazil. And in life, there are these, these experiences that we have where you can book an economy ticket to fly somewhere or you can book the good stuff, right? And you can fly on a private jet or you can fly first class. And let me tell you what, it is completely different, right? You can't believe you are on the same plane as, as people, you know, 20 rows back, that you are, you are allowed to listen to your iPod when the plane lands and, and stuff like that. And uh, the good stuff. So this is what we are going to be talking about tonight, the good stuff. How do I make sure in my life that I'm getting the good stuff? Who wants the good stuff? We don't want just the average or just the enough stuff or... You know, in, in South Africa, they started bringing out uh, products to save money that had no color on the box or anything like that. And then it was cheaper because they didn't have to spend money on packaging. But you know what? In our life with God, when we serve Him, when we choose Him, we get the good stuff. The good stuff. Amen? So turn with me to John 6. Last week, Clint spoke about the feeding of the 5,000 and uh, Jesus walking on the water and David Copperfield has been trying ever since. And we're going to read in uh, 53. But would you like to hear what a life of the good stuff sounds like? Would anyone like to hear that? This is in Psalm 23 from the message. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. That's some good stuff, right? You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and then you send me in the right direction. Does that sound like good stuff to anyone? Even when the way goes through the death valley, as Pastor Steve was talking about this morning, I am not afraid. You walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. What did Pastor Steve say this morning? Even... Right? If we go down to death, guess what? God raises the dead. Amen? You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. Hallelujah. That's got to be in Vegas. You revive my drooping head, my cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. That is the good stuff. If you want to print that out, go to um, Bible Gateway and you can uh, choose the message and you can print that out. Amen. Now let's talk about the good stuff. In life, when you go shopping, you can get the cheap clothes or you can get the the good stuff. And it usually costs more and it's not always just because of the name. I have a Hugo Boss shirt. Who knows Hugo Boss? It's the good stuff, just in case you didn't know. (laughs) My wife bought it for me. How long ago was that? Seven years ago, I still wear that shirt today, and it still looks pretty new. You know what? She may have paid three times the price for that shirt than any other shirt, but what shirt can you say seven years later, you are still able to wear it and still get compliments, right? It was the good stuff. So the good stuff will always cost us more, always. The good stuff always costs more, but there's a reason why it costs more. It provides that much more. Anyone here ever had the opportunity to fly business class? 
I praise the Lord. I've flown business class to, uh, from London to South Africa three times and never paid for it. Now, let me tell you what. You enjoy the good stuff when you're not paying for it. It cost somebody, but it wasn't me. Right? And, and, and you sit there and they bring you a, a, a silver knife and fork or gold knife and fork and everyone else is told that, uh, you know, because of terrorists, you have to get plastic. Obviously, terrorists don't fly business class. So it was amazing. The good stuff. All right? Why in our lives is the things that are the best, why do they cost the most? And many times we are not willing to pay the price, right? That's why McDonald's does so well. Do you know that? Because McDonald's meets the market for people that they just want to uh, meet a need in their stomach. You know, they just want to, they just want to, they don't want to be hungry anymore. They want to meet that need of hunger, but they don't want to pay Ruth Chris's price for the meal. So they, they will rather take a dip or a hit on the quality just to meet the need because they think it's the same thing. Okay? If you eat a, a steak that costs you 60 bucks or you eat a McDonald's that costs you four, what are you at the end of both? You fool. So you think, well, it's the same thing. And then in life, we start to treat our lives the same way. We start to think that we can satisfy the desire for God with other things and it still accomplish the same purpose. Well, it's still nourishment to my body, surely. Surely a, a burger patty made out of plastic has wonderful nourishment for my body. Right? And it costs four bucks. I mean, how can it go wrong? It's got vitamin C, they say. How many of you have seen that movie, 30 Days, where that guy eats McDonald's for 30 days? Now, I hope nobody from McDonald's is offended by this. But anyway, he ate McDonald's for 30 days and nearly died. That was what the movie showed. Every day he just ate McDonald's and it showed that obviously there was something in this meal that although it met the need of hunger, it was not supplying some vital things for living. And I want to ask you, what are you feeding on? And this is going to be our question. Okay, John 6 verse 53. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Okay, so Jesus is just making sure that we know he's not lying. Because he used to kid a lot, right? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on the bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Okay, so heaven has a restaurant. Okay, and they put a sign outside today special. Flesh and blood. Fantastic, who's hungry? This is the good stuff. This is the good stuff. And it might sound a little crazy, but by the end of this service, I really hope that you have got an appetite for the good stuff. And the world's version for your spirit of McDonald's, you will lose your taste for that, and you will say, I'm willing to pay the price to eat the good stuff. Even if I have to skip some other things to save up the resources needed to eat the good stuff, I can only eat the good stuff all right let's carry on you are what you eat there's a nice picture there for you <laughs> you are what you eat have you ever heard that saying you are what you eat if you eat a lot of fruits with calcium what are you going to have in your body calcium that's how they promote milk and oranges and stuff like that eat this and you will get calcium because you are what you eat. But you know, there are some things that don't have rapid effects on your physical body when you eat them. They take long term. And there are some things that have rapid effects. How many of you have ever been to a buffet? And it was an expensive buffet, so you felt it was your God-given right to eat your money's worth. Okay? Anyone? 
And you were doing okay up until they, you got to the, the dessert section. You were feeling all right, and there was chocolate cake, there was chocolate mousse, there was Italian kisses, there was, you know, flamby or creme brulee, whatever it was. And you thought, well, you know, obviously Jesus is, is putting this before you to bless you, so you <laughs> took one of everything. And immediately after consumption, you felt the guilt of your sin. Right? And you were like, oh, oh. And you walked out of the restaurant like that. That had a rapid effect. Now, in our lives, there are things that we do that have instant effect. You do something bad and you instantly know it, right? If I fight with my wife, it's not like two weeks later that I realize something is wrong. It's instant, right? And those are... Those are good things because the sign of what has happened is right there. It's in our face. So it's a good thing because then we'll sort it out. Just like if your stomach's hurting because you've eaten too much, you are aware that there is a problem. Those aren't the dangerous ones. Here's the danger. My favorite candy bar. Clint spoke about this months ago, and I just want to reiterate this. If I eat this candy bar now, am I going to put on weight? If I eat this candy bar, would you notice anything? Of course not, right? I'll enjoy it. I'll get a little bit hyper and you'll all be jealous, all right? <laughs> but if I eat this candy bar for, what happens if I eat it for a week? When I got up to preach next week, would you see any difference? No, because I have eaten it for a week and none of you know the difference. <laughs> what happens if I eat this for a month? What happens if I eat this for a year? You see, the effects are slow, but the effects are sure to come. And it says the wages of sin are death. The wages of sin are death. If I am putting death in my spiritual body, what type of fruit am I reaping? I'm reaping death. And it may not be apparent straight away. This is a scary part. You might do something that you know or make a choice or step out where you know it's not right and nothing seems to happen. Anyone ever done that? I'll use speeding for an example. Okay? You speed one day. Billy's on his lunch break. He doesn't catch you. So you speed the next day. You go a little bit faster. Nothing happens. So you speed the next day. A month later, you're doing 200 down Main Street. (laughs) Because you thought there was no consequences. And all of a sudden, Christian Billy is locking you in jail. right? The wages of sin is death. God says, do not be mocked. What a man sows, he will will reap. Let me ask you tonight, what are you feeding yourself? What are you feeding yourself? It may seem like a simple, obvious question, but when you look at your life and you look at your week, what are you feeding yourself? Because Jesus says, unless we are eating his flesh and drinking his blood, we do not have life. Everybody wants to experience life, right? We try everything we can on the budgets that we have to experience life. Your budget may only allow to go to movies once a week. But you know what? Why are you going to movies? Because you're trying to capture a little bit of life. The world tells us in order to have life, we've got to do what? We've got to go out. The world tells my wife that in order to have life, she's, she's got to make sure that I dress well. Okay? These are the things that that we have been fed, that in order to experience life, these are the things we've got to eat. We've got to eat homes, we've got to eat fashion, we've got to eat cars, we've got to eat... Now, there's nothing wrong with those things, but when those things become our main consumption, what do you think the fruit is going to be in our bodies, in our spiritual bodies, right? Can I get an amen? amen? Here's another one. What are you allowing people to feed you? That's a massive one. That is a massive one. I have seen so many people with good intentions mess people up. Pastor Steve has said it a few times, but when people say, I'll just be realistic, right? Somebody who's trusting God in faith and standing, and then somebody who's older, who's been beat down by life, comes and says, well, just be realistic. What did they just feed that person? Doubt and death. Right? You say, I'm trusting God for the perfect mate. And someone says, that doesn't happen. 
What are you allowing people to feed you? Because what you, you, may not, you may eat well when you choose to eat. But when you go to other people's house and they're whipping out fried chicken, you're still eating it, right? I, and on a side note, I had to ask God to deliver me a fried chicken because I thought that was definitely God's gift to earth. But in a spiritual sense, so what am I saying? You go around to spend time with somebody and their conversation, what they are putting into you, their experience of God and their, their image of God is negative. And it's bad for your spiritual body. What are you allowing people to feed you? Just like you would not allow somebody to put garbage or rotting food for you to physically eat. You would say no, right? Hopefully. You've got to say the same thing when it comes to your spiritual growth. Because you know what? What happens to you spiritually is more important than what happens to you physically. Because you can look beautiful on the outside. You can have wonderful skin. You can be muscular and you can be rotten on the inside. And, and then what does the Bible say? What does a prophet of man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What does it matter if you look incredible on the outside, you have everything your heart desires, and you have no hope that God is who he says he is? And that can happen. I've seen people who got born again, who got excited for God, who were going for Him. They wanted to be missionaries. They wanted to be preachers. They wanted to lay hands on the sick. And, and some guy in church who was too churched, who forgot that we needed faith, right? Who was disappointed by life, whose who's maybe wife left him or maybe had a child die of sickness, got hold of that person and said, let me tell you the reality of Jesus. He doesn't do those things anymore. Somebody who's hurt passed on their theology of their experience and fed garbage into somebody else. Has anyone ever fed you garbage like that? Because I've had it many, many times. And it's rocked me. And it may have taken months, it may even have taken years to get your stomach pumped spiritually to get back to what God's Word says. Who are you allowing to feed into your life? For some people, they battle with pastors. I think that's, that is one of the greatest treasures that we have in this church. Our, fast, our pastors feed us good food, right? In other churches, they, their own pastors are telling them that this word isn't what it says it is. What are, you, what are you supposed to do in that? But here's the thing. The Bible says you, you don't need anyone to teach you because you have the Holy Spirit. So at the end of the day, I can come to the, to the Lord and I can say, Lord, I need you to show me. I need you to give me the good stuff. I need you to give me the good stuff because, Lord, you've, you're calling me to do a lot. Amen? Be careful who you let speak into your life. Be careful who you let speak into your life. I'm very particular. I know this may sound bad, but I'm very particular with who... This will sound bad. I will allow... <laughs> Daniela to hang out with. And you say, you're crazy. How many of you seen the movie Fireproof? Okay. In this movie Fireproof, they, they're on the verge of a divorce, right? And he gets hold of this book and now he's really loving his wife. He's doing it because he wants to save his marriage. His wife is at work, tells a group of women um, what he's doing. And they say, uh-uh, no way, girlfriend. He's just trying to get the money. And they feed her garbage. And you know what it does? It sends her off the deep end. That is why I'm, I'm particular. Because you know what? I'm bound to have a fight with my wife. It's going to happen. I, I prophesy. All right? <laughs> I'm a prophet. So it's bound to happen at some point. Even though it's, it's very, very infrequent. But you know what's going to happen when, when she's low or we have a fight? Somebody's going to speak into her life. And I don't want that somebody to be a dump truck offloading their garbage, right? I want that person to be giving the word of God, to be giving life. And the same thing for my life. I'm very particular with who I let speak into my life. Because the, you know what? When you let your guard down, sometimes when you're low, somebody hits you with some bad advice. A marriage is on the verge of divorce, right? And somebody says, oh, you'll find another one. There's plenty of fish in the sea. Kick her out. And then years later, you're like, geez, why did I ever listen to that guy? Be careful who you let speak into your life. Choose it when the times are good. Choose it when the times are good. Amen. Amen. Anyone getting something? Sure, I'm hungry from that steak. All right. 
Listen to this one, next one. Your ability, your performance is based on what you eat. How many people here have been an athlete in high school or something like that? Okay, the night before a race or a swimming meet or uh, g- gymnastics or uh, I think Kiko played badminton or something like that. He <laughs> was good, huh? It's very good. Lay dirt bikes to make up for it. So, uh, did you eat chocolate cake and ice cream the night before? Why not? Have you, ever, have you ever had a nice dessert and then gone for a run? And then had to call for the angels to make sure you weren't going to die? <laughs> what you eat affects your performance. True or false? What you eat affects your performance. You look at an athlete, especially the night before a race or the time leading up to a race, they are very particular about what they're eating. While others are out having ice creams, they having, you know, wheat pastas or... You know, stuff like that, getting carbo-loaded. Ever heard that term? Okay, well, let me tell you this. What you are eating spiritually is affecting your performance, and your performance is the word with an F called faith. Your performance is faith. Just like in my body, my performance is my muscles, right? Depending on my muscles and stuff like that, that is the ability that enables me to perform. My muscles in the spiritual realm is faith. That is what I exercise and that is what I use to accomplish God's purpose here on earth. To be able to bring it down from heaven, I use faith. And what I am feeding myself spiritually greatly affects my performance. If you are filling your mind with junk and you are letting people talk holes in your head about God, when it comes to having to conquer something in your life, guess what? You're already defeated. Do you see that? But if I will be careful about what I'm putting in myself, when it comes time for me to perform, what's going to happen? I'm going to succeed. I'm going to win. I've, I've noticed that with, with little baby Jordan. When I've been pumped up in the Word, where I've been strong in, in the Word, and I've been listening to sermons and, and researching, right? And she gets a cold or a cough. I'm right there. My faith is like a roaring lion going, in the name of Jesus, get out. When, my, when I haven't, right? When I've been watching movies, been on holiday, taking it easy and she gets sick. Have you ever had that experience? You're a little less hesitant to come with the force of heaven and say, who do you think you are? You're like, hey, oh my goodness. Please, Lord, maybe I don't really deserve it. But if you could, what's just happened? I've been feeding myself rubbish so my performance is down. When I, when I chew on God's word, it says faith comes by. Hearing and hearing What? the word of God hearing and hearing the word of God hearing and hearing hearing and hearing hearing and hearing until you're lying in your bed and when you when your your eyes are closed you're seeing those words you're hearing those words till you're dreaming that a Bible is chasing you in your dreams (laughs) right that is and you know what's happening on the inside your performance is growing your performance is growing. Then when, when the devil comes around as a roaring lion, you give him a good spiritual boot in the butt. Amen? When something tragic happens, you don't throw your hands up and say, Why, God? You say, Lord, what are we going to do in this situation? What do you want to bring out of this? Do you see the difference? All to do with what you are feeding yourself. So I ask you again, what are you feeding yourself? Now, is it more enjoyable to eat ice cream or to eat wheatgrass? Ice cream. Absolutely. But you know what? After you've eaten a healthy meal, like a, a plate of steamed vegetables, and I'm, I'm not on a health thing here, please. I'm just, I have to use this for an example. If you, if you want to enjoy ice cream, you, you call me up. I'll bring a spoon. <laughs> right? I'm talking in a spiritual sense. I never feel like ordering a salad. But once I finished my meal and it was a salad, I feel good. Right? I feel good. I feel like, wow, I made a good choice. I feel clean. What I really felt like was popcorn chicken. Right? That's what I wanted. That's what my body said, yes. And in the natural sense, my wife is like the Holy Spirit. 
choose the, choose the salad in that still small voice. <laughs> right? And you know what? She's right. And so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is right. Have you ever not felt like coming to church? Like tonight, you got here, and then you're like, geez, I'm actually, I'm so glad I came. Anyone? I'm so glad I came. This was just what I needed to hear. It's making those choices what we know, irregardless of what we feel sometimes. Sometimes I've got to override what my body say, and I've got to choose what's right to feed my body. You don't want salad? That's too bad. You need salad. You know what? Because I need you to perform. I need you to perform. So I'm speaking to my faith. Faith, I need you to perform. There are some mountains that we need moving. So don't tell me you feel like watching uh, movies. Tonight you're getting sermons because I need you to perform. Is that good? I'm very excited. So irrespective, there's at least one person leaving here excited tonight. Okay, how do we eat? How do we eat his flesh and drink his blood? All right, the first thing is we have to make a decision to consume, to consume him. And I'll explain this in a minute. Listen to this cool story. Two battleships assigned to the training squadron had been at sea on maneuvers in heavy weather for several days. I was serving on the lead battleship and was on watch on the bridge as night fell. The visibility was poor and uh, with a foggy patch. So the captain remained on the bridge keeping an eye on all activity. Shortly after dark, the lookout on the wing of the bridge reported light bearing on the starboard bow. Is it steady or moving astern? The captain called out. Look out, replied, steady, captain, which meant that we were all in a dangerous collision course with another ship. All right, so they've seen a light on their, on their path. The captain then called out to the signalman, signal that ship. We are on a collision course. Advise you change your course 20 degrees. Okay? Back came the signal. Advisable for you to change your course 20 degrees. The captain said, send, I am a captain, change your course 20 degrees. All right? I'm a seaman class, came the reply. You better change your course 20 degrees. By the time the captain was furious, he spat out, send, I am a battleship, change your course 20 degrees. Back came the flashing light, I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> we changed course. You know what? Who's the lighthouse? So many times in our life, we're trying to tell God what to do. We're trying to get him to change his course. We're trying to tell him to change his degrees that maybe the scriptures just aren't right, that if we just shifted them a little. You know what? We shouldn't be living together before marriage. But if we just shifted at 24, 20 degrees, there's no shifting. He is the lighthouse. Amen. If he said it, there's a reason for it. And if we don't obey it, what was going to happen to that ship? I was going to end up crashing. And the same thing will happen with our lives. I know I'm not that old, but I've learned by heavily testing God's word to find out that he is always right. And if we don't obey it, it ends up bad, not for God, but for me. Yet somehow when it came to the next time, I thought, well, maybe this scripture is different. Maybe this one's a little bendable. They're not. He is the lighthouse. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he said is truth, and it's for our benefit, like Yvette said. For the, he's waiting. Everything that he asks us to do is giving us a key so that we can unlock this blessing, this abundant life that he has for us. Why does he tell us to praise him in the midst of a storm? Is he uh, vindictive? You know, he's just lost everything. Now he says for us to praise him. Why does he say that? Because he's giving us a key to unlock the blessing. Why does he tell us to forgive? Why does he tell us to bless those that speak badly about us? He, does he have nothing better to do? Or is he trying to give us a key to unlock the blessing that he has for our life? It is the food that we need to eat, the nourishment. Have you ever been in hospital for a surgery or something like that and they gave you jello? You're like, I don't want the stinking jello, right? I want what that guy's eating. But you know, there are some times where our food has to be jello. Because if you had to eat a steak at that time, you'd die. And sometimes we're looking at someone else's life and we're like, Lord, I want that. And God's saying, I've got some nice jello for you. You're like, I don't want stinking jello. 
right? You're like, Lord, I want to be used mightily by you. And somebody shows up at your house that's hungry. You're like, get out of here. I don't have time for you. I'm waiting for God to use me mightily. <laughs> right? I must take the food that God has for me. And where do I get it? I get it from his scripture. Two people are reading the Bible. One person is being called to another country to be a missionary. And the other, body's, the other one is being called to pack chairs at church. Who's more in God's will? They're both in God's will. And God has the, has the Jeremiah plan for the both of them. Right? Where he has a good plan to bless us, not to harm us. Isn't that exciting? All right, so we have to make a decision to consume. What does that mean? That means that I need to take all of Jesus. I can't pick and choose from this Bible. That is the problem with Christianity today. If you were to tell the disciples that we, you know, are not so sure about the Holy Spirit and what He does, and we're not so sure about baptism, we're not so sure, yeah, but we'll take this part, we won't take, they would be horrified. And then they would say, well, is there any wonder why we don't experience what God has? Because we have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. We have to consume him. If you are wondering why you're not experiencing incredible things from God, I'm willing to bet it's because you've become picky. Right? Mm, A little bit of greens. Maybe some of that. God is not the buffet. He is the meal that we sit down and you say, bring it all. Whatever it is. Broccoli? Eh, Okay, I'll eat it. Brussels sprouts? Okay, Jesus, if you think I should eat Brussels sprouts, I'm going to eat Brussels sprouts. Amen? Instead of being so picky, if it's from God, it's good. That's the thing. So we need to have a a consuming mentality that when I come to this, I'm going to eat everything, even the maps. I'll eat the, the context, the concordance, whatever it is. Whatever it is between these covers, I'm going to eat it. And I'm not going to turn my nose up at anything that God has for me. Amen? Even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's scary, if it's from God, it's good. Amen. Can anybody tell I am excited? All right. Here's the thing. If you just have the Word, if you just study the Word without the Spirit, you'll dry up. Here's the Word. Is bread nice? But what is bread best accompanied with? A drink. Because bread is pretty dry. So is the Word of God. It says, The letter killeth, but the... Spirit gives life. Have you ever met somebody that's so about the Holy Spirit and has no word base? They are weird. Okay? To put it politically correct. Just word and you'll dry up. Just spirit and you will blow up. Never forget that. But the two together, they are the perfect meal. The body of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Okay, His Word and His Spirit, they go together. They are perfect together. Amen? And this is what we need. I need to come to His Word and I need to say, Lord, I'm going to consume what you have for me, but I cannot do it apart from the Holy Spirit. I need Him to explain it to me. I don't know if you had this in school, but we'd get books to study and then came the study guide. Because the book was a bit hard to understand, so you had the study guide. The Holy Spirit is the study guide. He is the one that enables me to take the word, to wield the sword, to eat the bread. Otherwise, I'll choke and die. And you think that hasn't happened? How many tragic things have happened from people who misused the Bible? Who remembers the Ku Klux Klan? They were Christians. They went to church on Sundays. How on earth do you reconcile killing someone, hating someone of another color, and then... And then going to church on a Sunday, and yet they were in the Word. You know what? They were choking themselves to death and everybody else with them because they were missing what? The conviction of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit to bring life to this Word. Okay? So I have to be consuming the bread and the wine, the body and His blood. Amen? We have to be childlike in our approach. Have you ever seen a child eat a birthday cake? If you're not careful, they'll eat the candles, right? They'll eat everything, and you have to pull the tray away because they're trying to munch that as well. Have you ever seen an adult? How do you eat a, a cake? Uh, well, I don't, that, you know, the, the creamy floor, well, that's just too rich for me, right? 
and you're like, pick pieces. You can always see when an adult's been eating a birthday cake, it's got like a little bit chewed out. <laughs> Where the kids eat and they're back with, the, with crumbs and saying, get out some more. That is how we need to come to God. That is, that is what it means like to come as a child, to say, Lord, I'm going to eat everything. You put candles in front of me, I'm going to mind I'm going to gobble them up. <laughs> Whatever you have, I'm going to gobble it. God, be careful what you put in this book because I'm going to believe it, right? Instead of saying, oh, I'm not so sure. We were talking tonight in, in, in a worship thing. Most of the miracles happen in third world countries in the world. Most of the miracles happen in third world countries. I assure you, in third world countries, they do not know the Hebrew and the Greek. Now, that's not an excuse for us to not study and show ourselves approved. But there's something for us to learn there. Don't, you don't have to wait for God to move when you think you know everything. You, you jump on a scripture, you ask the Holy Spirit to help you, not take it out of context. You ask the Holy Spirit to make it alive and then you run with it. Amen? Amen. Okay, so to eat his flesh, we do this by coming to him and obeying his words. All right, in John 15, 7, it says, If my words remain in you. All right, and then in John 6, 63, it says, The words that I have spoken are life. That's how we eat his flesh. And how do we drink his blood? By believing. By believing what we are reading and by being filled with the Holy Spirit daily, constantly. No one here gets by with just one drink a day, right? And if you've ever had an easy, you have had the good stuff. If Jesus redid this today, instead of wine, he would say, easy. Amen? So you need to constantly be asking the Holy Spirit to fill you. Otherwise, you're going to be choking on his word. Otherwise, it just becomes dry. It just becomes dull. It just becomes... Right? A labor. But when the Holy Spirit, you're taking about drinking, taking about drinking, it is, it is wonderful. And you know what? It never runs out. It never runs out. However hungry you are, He has a meal bigger than that to feed you. And then you're going to get more hungry, and He has more. However passionate you get about His Word, He's got things to show you, revelation and, and, and fruit to produce through you that you haven't even imagined. Amen? So that is our meal tonight. Who's hungry? For God? Amen? So this is what we're going to do. We are just going to worship some more. And it's, I'm asking you to come to God and have a meal. You ask God to fill you. You tell God how you're going to come after Him. You have that conversation with Him. And before you leave here tonight, I'm asking you to eat His body and drink His blood. All right? by surrendering to Him, by believing Him, by coming as a child, that you can leave here having had a meal. Amen? Some of you need a Red Bull. <laughs> you can do that. Amen.